with that, I'd like to open it to questions. We've got uh, some pretty great people up here, and I know we have a lot of uh, sharp reporters in the audience. So, No? <laughs> Start with a softball, yeah. which is um, do are any of you familiar with this new organization called Report for America? That um, I thought maybe Chuck might be the most, and 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 if so, what do you think of it? Do you think it has gives this the news desert, the local news deserts, any hope? I think it does. This is uh, this is the idea of doing reporting on the ground in 50 states uh, and sort of. It's never been attempted by a single entity. Uh, the philanthropic world has thrown some serious money behind this to basically fill in some of the gaps we just discussed, uh, uh, where you don't have people covering certain things that are desperately in need of and actually essential to a democracy for them to be covered. Uh, and, and the folks who are doing it are respected journalists who have done great work themselves, including organizational type work where knowing how to do that is part of their backgrounds. So the question, so the idea is great, and it's pretty well funded as I understand it. The, the trick is uh, how will it work, how well will it work, how, how many people will they have, how long will the money last, <laughs> and sick, you know, there are all these elements that will affect the success of it. But our biggest problem, as we all know, is is the hinterland. It's not Washington right. and New York. It's the so. rest of the nation. And if this is a way to start to spread out and have local coverage about those in power at that level throughout, uh, locally, state, regionally, in certain parts, uh, that is not really happening right now in a lot of ways. So I think it's it does offer hope. What I don't know to be very candid is how much money they really have and exactly who are they going to get. I mean, my worry is, uh, and don't get me wrong, I've taught hundreds of students every year and many work for me at my investigative reporting workshop. I'm all for it, but I'm all for young people learning how to investigate the bastards. There's probably nothing more important. However, I hope that there's more some other adult supervision <laughs> at the, like the middle levels yeah. because I, uh, I know that they were trying to get folks on the ground and state capitals and all those kinds of things. And that's fantastic. The question is, what it, how will it turn out and how successful will it be? I sure hope, is hope like hell it works, because it's desperately needed. And it was a great idea to try to fill that breach. And you also, I just think it's also really important for that, which I'm super hopeful for that, is you have to sustain the coverage. You know, and that, that's something that really worries me, especially on the local level. You have to stay on these guys. I remember having Carol here bring back all the Miami Herald memories, but I, I wrote some stories about a Boston developer who had opened up shop in Opelika <coughs> and had stolen about $25 million from a poverty uh, program oh. down in Miami. He ended up going to prison, but Opelika is still a mess. I think the Herald did some amazing work last year on Opelika and, you know, part of the issue, and that was another investigative group that came in and did it, and so it's kind of like a stone skipping across the water when what you really need is a heavy, something heavy that sinks down to the bottom. And the sustainability is something that, that, that really worries me. There's a lot of money right now sloshing around. And a lot of people you know, see this as a crisis. And we need to be able to keep the funding up uh, for these efforts. And because the model is not coming back from what, from what it seems like. So we, we're going to have to figure out how do we get that coverage sustained in these local communities. Yes, right here. Um, I have a question, maybe for Jason or any of the other uh, journalists up there. I've never been an investigative reporter, but I, it's an area that I've always been interested in getting into. I work here in Boston at the ABC station. Um, I guess, how do you start? Because you were saying, Amory mentioned that one of the top, you looked into property assessments, and it was one of those things people just always talked about. Is, is that what we should be doing, just kind of? putting your ear to the ground, or I, mean, I, I don't know if this sounds like a lame no, no, uh, first time a... reporter question, but I've never done investigative reporting. But So how do you start? How, where do you find mm -hmm. the, the good stories? Well, one suggestion that I always um, tell people is read other investigative 
works. Mm -hmm. So um, I, th I think that starts. I remember when I was starting out at IRE, I was obsessed with Barlett and Steele, yeah. who were two investigative journalists. At the t my favorite work of theirs was at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I just, I actually read that stuff. And I remember Anne Marie's work uh, at, at, at the Chicago Tribune. And I, you know, I, I would read these things and like study them, you know. And then, you know, I always also tell people um, learning something about data, I think, is really important these days um, because it brings sort of an objective, verifiable fact patterns that you can kind of point to. And a lot of people that, you know, are, are mid career, you know, sometimes you have to put in your own your own time, you know, like on the weekends and things like that. It's, um, but it is addictive and I think that, you know, I don't wor worry about working on the weekends like that's what I like to do. Instead of gardening, I like to look through documents or whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, if I could just add, I, I, uh, I teach investigative reporting for the last 10 years uh, at American University and Barlett and Steele are friends of mine, very close friends. In fact, they donated their 400 boxes of their personal papers to American University. So if you ever want to see what they did. Uh, uh, but but I, I, I believe that I, what I teach is embarrassingly simple, uh, which means it really is not simple. But it, it's, it's a cliche. And I admit it's a cliche. I'm embarrassed to say. But it, the old peeling the onion, I, my students have to start with an idea. They have to start uh, from secondary sources of all sorts, multimedia. They've got to get see something that doesn't sound right or seems peculiar or just something they know themselves. But you start with secondary, then you go to primary records. And the first few weeks and months, you shouldn't talk to a human, as far as I'm concerned. And you'll see patterns. And they'll jump off the page at you. And then you start to talk. But you don't go to the person you're investigating. You go to the outer edge and all the way in and it's very systematic and all of the investigations I've done in the last several decades are that way. I'm a, I'm a anal retentive pain in the ass. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, sorry. I, will, I want to suggest also that uh, being an investigative reporter isn't um, something that you put on your auto sig in your email. Um, it's cool. Yeah. I'll admit it. It's yeah. very cool. But you don't have to have two years and right. and you know twelve drawers in your file cabinet to do it. Um, to me, what makes a good investigative reporter, what makes a good reporter, is skepticism. Is approaching your job with skepticism and telling people that you cover, you know, I'm from Missouri. Show me, and and challenging everything they tell you. And when you have a pretty good uh, feeling in your gut that they're lying to you, push back real hard and, and ask for the records and never accept no for an answer. And uh, you know, when we were, some of us were much younger, um, we had teachers who said and mentors, ah, you know, you don't need to be on the I team to be a good, and you don't. You, you just have to have that sensibility that your job is is to be skeptical and to push back and I might add you know going back to those lofty ideals um, I, I think part of it also is is the old and I guess it wasn't really Joseph Pulitzer who said it for the first time but I think we have to comfort the afflicted and, and afflict the comfortable and and if we're doing anything other than that um, shame on us I sometimes think in a way Every reporter should be an investigative reporter. I mean, in a, in a way, it's, it should not be a term reserved for uh, the elite in the business. I mean, every reporter really is an investigative reporting. It's up to any daily reporter on the street to say, really, why, or how come, or I'm sorry, but that doesn't quite add up. That's investigative reporting. Yes, Maria. Uh, sort of related to Nick's question, <coughs> how do you convince, or how did you convince your editors to spend so much time, so much of your time, reporting a complex issue as taxes, a very hard issue as juvenile detention, or even in your case, an issue that can be controversial for part of the audience of, of the globe. How, do you have any, usually, any trouble getting uh, editors to really invest this effort, this time, this I think nothing succeeds like success, and and once you get out there and you do journalism, and you start to develop a track record as you know someone 
who's going to you know, look at her boss and, and say, I, I think I have this. And then at the end of the day, you have this. The next time you ask, they're not going to be as, as squeamish. Um, you, you know, you've, you've got to pitch what, what you can realistically accomplish, and then you have to accomplish it, I think. Uh, I'm sort of the editor, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't I have the luxury of not having to ask somebody if I can do a story, which is why I started the center in the first place. Uh -huh. uh, but one of my favorite uh, sort of corny sayings is, "Watch what they say, and then watch what they do." Those in power, you'll always find a gap, uh, not always, but quite frequently, and it's real simple. But if a person continues to say something and it doesn't sound right, and then you start to actually look at the reality, that's a natural story. And you could do it in a day or several months. It depends on the situation. But it's just, it's just plain fun. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, because it's not hard. I mean, honestly, humans are inconsistent. Uh, and they are occasionally, thank God, stupid. Uh, and <laughs> it's very helpful. I was really lucky to have you know, editors who have always supported my work and, you know, and, and to work for a paper that, that had the kind of resources to give me two years to, to really dig into something. It was I, not totally skeptical at first, but I remember going to them and saying, yeah, I mean, I remember going to my, my uh, George Papajohn, who's the investigations editor, and I think he said at one point, so you're telling me that the that, that rich people, we're going to write a story that says rich people aren't paying enough in taxes and people that, you know, get our paper aren't paying enough in taxes. And, um, you know, I think there is a moment of squeamishness for all of us, but, if, you know, they were so supportive. And I, I agree with Carol that, you know, um, past efforts help. You know, they knew that, I think they had faith that we could bring, bring it home. And, and we did after maybe far too long, but eventually got, got to where we needed to be. The good editor is key. Key. Anyone else? Yes, way in the back. Yeah. Thank you very much for um, speaking today. We all appreciate all the work that you've done. Um, my question is actually about uh, so much of what you've talked about is, is you know, the, the core of what it is that we do, we all try to do, is, is, is about our, and around truth. But it seems like sort of in this current moment, um, for some people, you know, some of the folks out there reading, <coughs> truth doesn't matter anymore. And I wonder if that makes you rethink how or what kinds of projects that you want to do or focus on because of that. That skepticism, that sort of innate skepticism that, that is sort of coming out of this moment of division and partisanship. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> My, my path to um, doing projects at the Miami Herald started uh, many years ago on the social services beat, um, where more than anything else I covered uh, child welfare and juvenile justice. And, and I, I took that job at the Herald very deliberately because I'd covered the same beat at what was then the St. Petersburg Times. Um, those are issues that matter to me. and. I think all of us have a, a kind of sweet spot. I, I could, by the way, never, never, never do what you do because I'm not smart enough and I don't understand numbers. And I've worked with you. We've done numbers together. Um, and I'm not being modest. I'm telling the truth. I'm not smart enough to do what he does. But, but what I can do is I, I understand, you know, how states treat the, the most uh, frail, and vulnerable and uh, endangered people wh whom we are supposed to protect. And that's my sweet spot. And, and so the long answer to, you know, after the short answer to your question is, those are the stories I'm going to tell, um, <coughs> always. And, and I, to me, that's, that's our job. That's, that's, we, we get issued a notepad and a pen because we are supposed to, um, be another cliche, but, but we have to speak for people who can't. Um, and and I just as a very quick sidelight, one of the things that bothers me the most about the period that we're in right now, and I mean 
kills me is that there are elements of our profession and there are um, large numbers of Americans who think that it's their job to afflict the afflicted. Um, and, and I have a real cuss word for that, which I'm not going to say, but we should never be doing that. Never. Never. I, I was just going to say, I, 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 the truth with a capital T is something that makes me incredibly uncomfortable. I'm always very skeptical about whether my stories get to the truth. I try to come as close to the truth as I can get with the facts that I can corral together. And I think that we have to be skeptical, not just of politicians and policymakers, but also of ourselves. And so I'm always wary of, of saying I got to the truth on, on something. You know, it's, it's uh, not I strive to get there. That's what we want to do. And it's kind of like this goal that ne I'll never actually reach it. But, but you know, I, I think that's one way maybe to do it, is to not be so presumptuous that I've come to the truth. You know, I, I, I've laid out facts that show a pattern and, you know, um, so. I think ideological uh, blinders have not helped. Uh, yeah. So, you know, different parties have different views of, oh yeah, the facts. And we have different media now that have their facts, uh, the echo chamber effect. Uh, we had it from the 60s on with newsletters going to Republicans, which eventually becomes Fox News, which is proposed by Roger Ailes to Richard Nixon in 72. He ends up on the air in the 90s. You also have 24-7 news, so uh, starting with CNN in 81, and that meant that sound bites got shorter. Uh, actual policy making waned because everyone would go on the air and trash and yell at each other on cable on split screens, and so decorum and discussion of serious subjects by our leaders, both parties, uh, different bodies, uh, started to wane. Sound bites, as I said, went down the tubes, mostly shouting, and the lack of substance became obviously quite apparent. And, um, and that's where we are today. And the role of journalists is to somehow uh, peer into something resembling sanity and <laughs> facts. and. And, and, and decorum about where the country is, what has actually occurred. And to me, it's the voice of reason, and that's why I'm you know, proud to be a journalist and I wouldn't do anything else. To cut through the noise with the facts. Yeah, what a, what a concept, right? I think that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, uh, sentiment to end our discussion on. I want to both uh, thank and congratulate our panelists and all of you for coming. I, um, <clears throat> I was, I've been thinking about Nick's very good question, you know, where the stories come from. And I have this flashback to a conversation with a colleague once who, when I was a very young reporter, taught me to, um, to say at all times and all stories, why is this happening now? And so I remember sitting through just, you know, endless city council meetings and every zoning change, every contract, every, you know, no bid for uh, new street lights, every street paving, every, everything. Like, why now? And sometimes the answers are prosaic because we need a new street light there, and, but often they're not. And it's a really, really simple question that um, sort of opened me to a different way of thinking about my work. And um, I just really am so grateful to all of um, the journalists who joined us <clears throat> today um, for not just asking that question, but for being relentlessly um, dogged, um, even strident and insistent um, about finding the answers. I am um, just in awe of all of you and really overwhelmed and um, so amazed at the quality of your work. And I feel very privileged to have you all with us today and to be a part of Neiman that um, is honoring you. And so to um, Megan and to Audra and to Karen and to Jason and to Chuck and to Carol and Mike, thank you again. Um, please join me in thanking them, not just for their time here today, but for the work they've done and the work they'll go back to do. Thanks so much.